I think President Obama should have kept his mouth shut. You know, um, we know he doesn't like much this administration is doing. That's understandable. But I think it's a little bit classless, frankly, to uh, critique an administration that comes after you. You had your shot. You were there for eight years. Um, I think the, the tradition that the Bush has set up of not critiquing the president who comes after you is a good tradition. Cocaine Mitch is like, hey, Barack Obama, you're gonna you're gonna step into the you're gonna step into the Thunderdome on this one with Trump. You better you better be ready for what comes your way. You know, you better be ready for the fight ahead. And you know, Mitch doesn't like the break with tradition here that the Bush has said. It's not a long standing tradition, but I think it is a sensible one. Or the most recent president. I do think it's different for somebody once, you know, there's been a I think that the president that precedes you as president, you shouldn't overly politicize, especially in the case of Barack Obama, when it looks like there's a lot of evidence that your administration tried to wound and maybe even destroy the administration that took over from you because they're from the other party, maybe be a little more circumspect about stuff, maybe just be a little more chilled out when it comes to the Trump administration, if you're Barack Obama. And, you know, Cocaine and Mitch don't play, as we know. So it, t- it takes a lot for him to, to wade into some of these issues. He's not, he's not a verbal brawler, but he's right on this one. He, he thinks that the, that the Obama administration... Well, look, President Obama, he knew that this was going to leak from this phone call. It's not even a leak. It's really like a... Like a might as well be a, you know, a press... Uh, something they put out as a press piece trashing the Trump administration on a phone call with 3,000 people. That's that's announcing it publicly for all intents and purposes. Uh, and, and I don't think that, that Barack Obama is ready for what he would be up against if he really wants to publicly tangle with Trump. Uh, he Barack Obama ran against, against John McCain and Mitt Romney, two guys who were very interested in the elite press, liking them, or at least patting them on the head sometimes and saying, you know, oh, you're a good little conservative, you know, good little John McCain, good little Mitt Romney. Once in a while, when they're not talking about how they're throwing old ladies off the cliff because they won't give them health care and, you know, all this other stuff. Right. But they those two Republicans came from the old school of Democrats get to kick sand in our eyes, get to, you know, do the low blow, you know, do the kidney punches, whatever they want to do. And we sit there and say, oh, but we play by the rules. And Trump is just like, really, you want to fight dirty? I'll fight dirty, too. That was really people always talk about the ge- the political genius of Trump. It's just recognizing what many of us had seen for a long time, which is that we thought on the right we would get points for playing nice and that eventually the good guys would win out if we were the ones who were being uh, yeah, if we were holding back and being gentlemanly. And no, they just kept throwing stuff in our face and then, you know, laughing all the way into the White House and into in a majority in the House and majority in the Senate and trying to push the country to socialism. And yeah, sure. Good job, conservatives. But at least you played nice as you were getting slapped around. Trump doesn't do that. He, he, that's not the school that Trump uh, Trump goes to. So or, or that he teaches. <laughs> Forget about goes to. So I don't know if, if Barack Obama would have uh, quite the the time that he thinks he would if he were to really become vocal. But here's the other problem Democrats face. They can't rely on Joe Biden himself to make the case. I can't rely. I mean, do, do we really think that Biden against Trump in a, in a public forum, that this is going to go well for the guy who's like, uh, you know, the thing and the place and, uh, and, and, and think of who they've think of who the Democrats who claim that Trump has, you know, he's a liar and, 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 and a crook and so dishonest. The people that they put forward are Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden. These are the most virtuous worthwhile leaders the Democratic Party can find. Hillary Clinton, who uh, would gladly pay for the pleasure of selling her office, and Joe Biden, who, if he can find where his office is, we're all supposed to clap for him and, you know, bring him some apple juice in a sippy cup. This is ridiculous. Enough is enough. But they're not going to they're not going to change. So get ready for they're going to call every chip uh, that they have, they're going to they're going to throw in the middle here. They're going to do everything they can to take down Trump. And that's going to mean calling Obama out of semi retirement or whatever it is.
The Ahmad Arbery case has gotten a lot of conversation going across the country, and people seem to be somewhat divided on this one. I'm, I'm a little surprised, but when you look at some of the factors involved, the, the divisions perhaps should have been expected, uh, at least with the usual narratives popping up and uh, people who are, are going into one side or the other of what they think happened here. We're joined by Rob Smith to help us work through this. He's a contributor for The First TV, which you can watch on Pluto. Also, you can download The First TV's app. Uh, Rob is also the author of Always a Soldier, which is coming out soon. Rob Smith, good to have you on, buddy. Hey, thanks for, thanks for having me, bud. All right, man. So there's been some new developments, but t- <laughs> tell us where we are right now in the Ahmad Arbery case, uh, and, and especially with, yeah. with what, what is the, the new video that's, that's come up. So, so first of all, with the Ahmad Arbery case, you know, this is it kind of exploded the Internet uh, predictably uh, upon racial lines over the past week and a half. What we find out is that back a couple of months ago, a young unarmed black man was was killed um, by two white men in Georgia. Um, the the initial narrative was that this person was jogging and that he was hunted down and, and, and killed by these men. Um, now we're finding out that there was a lot of stuff going on before. And there's kind of a lot of questions as to, you know, what he was doing, what the entire situation was. I think that when we first start talking about the conversation, we have to start off with the fact that um, in no way was his death justified, full stop. So we have to start right there. Um, And then we get deeper into the case and we find out that these were two men who maybe thought that um, he was somebody that was suspected of robberies in the neighborhood. But now we're finding out that there were no robberies reported in the neighborhood. So that's um that's making that narrative a little bit shakier we do know that they attempted to have some sort of citizens arrest where they tried to stop him at gunpoint to question them um and and the thing about this is is that fundamentally you take race out of it um as an american me or you buck we are not required to submit to the will of another american that is not part of law enforcement just because they brandish a weapon um, so so that's full stop. And I, and I think that that's one a part of the narrative that a lot of people are missing. Um, and there's a lot of, of information coming out. They're saying, OK, well, this person um, who has been identified as a Mott Aubrey was lurking around a construction site, looking around um, out of pure curiosity. Again, doesn't justify um, stopping somebody, doesn't justify murdering them at all. Um, I have went to construction sites and looked around because I'm nosy. Um, I think that most Americans have done that. Um, So I I think that the biggest problem with the narrative and the biggest problem with the social media fueled um, conversation about this that is so heavily drawn down racial lines is that there are a lot of people that are just trying to get to the bottom of exactly what happened. And there's a lot of people on the right sharing information say uh, it's video of him at a construction site. Now there was video um, of allegedly him at other construction sites. And then we find out that that video is not necessarily him. Um, there are there are photos that have been disseminated on social media of one of the two men charged in the, in the killings at some sort of uh, neo-Nazi right. white supremacist rally. That has been debunked. So there's a lot of information right. coming this out. Is what, on this all is what sides happens right with now. the with the the internet detective work that a lot of there are real detectives, right? There's real law enforcement that yeah. has power of subpoena, and and people get on the record, yeah. and there are consequences for lying, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then there's just the the Twitter, the Facebook, the what people find here, and all of a sudden it, it sort of catches catches fire. But one thing that I I think that we're seeing in this, and, and I wanted your your take on it, Rob, is that. People tend to, in these instances, it becomes very ideolo- ideologically charged and very politicized. I think that because there are these, the, the video, for example, of him at the construction site, it seems to me like some people think, oh, so there's this video before. Now we're in a changed situation than we were. And maybe they think back to the, uh, the case uh, in Ferguson, right, where Mike Brown was yeah. strong arm robbery, involved in a strong arm robbery right before. But. They're not making the critical distinctions between, as you point out, a strong arm robbery is not standing uh, and a strong arm robbery that leads to law enforcement, actual law enforcement stopping you is a very different thing from standing in a construction site and then having people stop you on the road because they think that maybe you're involved in something when they're not law enforcement. I just feel like people are trying to fit this into narratives instead of looking at the evidence as it comes out and then people get dug into 
one view or the other or they won't change yeah. based upon the facts as they actually come. Like the fact of him standing at a construction site is not damning. And I think that the, but people say, oh, well, there's a video and this is before and they start to, you know, the wheels start turning in this direction. No, that's not damning. No, it's not. And, and I think that uh, trying to look at this as objectively as possible, I think that when people get too bogged down into, well, we need to find this video, we need to find that video and, and we need to prove this, that. Um, that starts to to seem too much like kind of trying to justify this young man's murder. And that's, I think, that where we don't want to be. But I also th- I think that there can be two things can be true at the same time. You can have empathy for this young man who lost his life. And you can also be very wary of media fueled narratives um, that are meant to push a racially divisive uh, message. And yeah. I think that you have to you have to do both at the same time. And and at, at a point, and you brought up Mike Mike Brown, and that was a really good point to bring up because we know that the hands up, don't shoot narrative uh, was false. So that was proven to be false, and we know this years after the fact. And I think that now, what the internet sleuths are trying to do is they're trying to disprove the just the jogger narrative, and it is very possible that that is a false narrative that he wasn't just the jogger that was stopped by these people. Um, still doesn't justify his death. But I, I think that we need to make sure that we're having, number one, empathy for this person. Um, number two, not trying to play internet sleuths with with footage that is not reliable or that is not verifiable. Um, and number three, make sure that we're not bogged down into these kind of racially divisive narratives that keep Americans thinking it's us versus them. It's white versus black. It's, you know, all you know, these white people in Georgia were obviously white supremacists. And when you look at what Atlanta's mayor has done when she's commented on the situation, she has completely inject, injected race and racism into it when she brings up, oh, well, you know what, in, in her words, uh, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, in her words, Trump's racist rhetoric is what makes this acceptable in America. And, and, and I think that we really right. have that, to That's really reckless, to that's reckless politicization, of course. I mean, the, pre- the it, president it, it is, is not responsible reckless. for what two, two guys did. And yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah, no, not at all. Not at all. And, and it's really reckless. And I think that people, whether you're an elected office, whether you're a media personality, whether you have this reach like, like you do, like I do, I, I think that we just have to be careful in the way that we discuss things. I think yeah. in, in the information that we put out and the information that we comment on. I, th- I think that there's also a lack of real understanding in the general public. And it, it's very it seems to be very regional. And, and there's almost a cultural differentiation between left and right on this, on their understanding of self-defense law and use of force, uh, use yes. of force as it as it applies to firearms. You know, yeah, there are places like Georgia's an open carry state. But if you, as, as you know, Rob, if, if you brandish or you draw down on somebody without justification, that's a felony, right? Because anyone could understand yeah. that if someone just pull, you know, if someone doesn't like what you said to them outside of a grocery store and they just pull a gun out and point it at you, that's obviously a crime. I mean, that's a threat of, of, of imminent violence. And so then when you get into this exchange where there's video, which remember that the crime happened, I know you know this, but for our audience, crime happened over two months ago. I mean, sorry, the incident, yeah. I, you know, we don't. Uh, that they've been charged with murder, so they're they're uh, the two the two guys who shot him have been charged with the crime. But the incident happened over two months ago. It's because of the video, but the video shows an exchange where I think a lot of people put themselves in the situation of somebody with a firearm who's not law enforcement tells you to stop, uh, you, and they have no they have no justification. They're now inciting a situation where your fight or flight mechanism may kick in. And so, the, yeah. you know, th- this this gets very tricky because you can't just pull a gun on somebody because you think they did something wrong. And then what is the actual uh, what is the actual legal ramification of if that leads to a scuffle, which looks like is what happened and this individual got shot. But you cause that scuffle yeah. based on false premises. What's the what's the crime? What's the charge? You know, I mean, it seems to me like they're looking yeah. at at least involuntary manslaughter. Yeah, and I want to bring up we'll bring up uh, one of our colleagues at the first Dana Lesh, who I shared this on Twitter. She wrote a really, really great piece um, that really broke down the laws and the legality um, and what's going on in this in this case. And I think that a lot of people would would do themselves very well to go read her piece. I thought it was very well well thought out. I thought it was brilliant, actually. Um, it's the most well thought out piece that I've seen anybody write when it comes to this. But yeah, you have to think about the fact that. 
you we're, we're not vigilantes in America. It, it's not what we do. And so you can't make the argument that when a random citizen, because mind you, again, the, this is not law enforcement. So when a random citizen brandishes a gun at you, you're not required to submit. Um, and that fight or flight mechanism, like you said, takes place. Now, look, I, I'm, I'm former military. Somebody brandishes a gun at me, you know, the, in my mind, that's life or death. And, and you cannot fault this young man who, who so tragically lost his life for standing up for himself and, and, and fighting back when a non-law enforcement citizen brandished a weapon at him. And I think that that's the most important key here. And, and I really don't want us to miss that. Yeah, I mean, I had a I had an edge weapons instructor a long time ago. A friend of mine who was an edge weapons instructor overseas in Iraq, and you know, he told me once, if if you pull a knife on me, I'm not going to wait to see how good you are with that knife. And that was just his way of saying, right. you know, he's like, I'm I'm not going to see, you know, oh, uh, what is this person going to decide to do with me? He's like, I'm going to take action in in defense of myself. Um, and look, this is this is a case that's obviously going to continue to get a lot of national attention. It seems like law enforcement now, the federal. Uh, federal investigators are being called in on this one too, so there'll be a lot of uh, a lot of attention paid to it. And I mean, I just just be- before we go, does it feel to you, Rob, like like the media gets any better at being with these with these very inherently racially charged cases, or or at least they're inherently racially charged because of the way the media depicts them? Uh, but there are there are you know undertones here that that come to the fore. Do you feel like they ever get better at this? Do they ever get more responsible? I, they do not. But and the thing about it is, is that that's a complicated question as well, because that depends on on who you want to call the media. Um, if we're talking about the media just in terms of national news, um, then they, I think, try as best as they can to to go down the facts. But then if we're talking about media in terms of politicians, in terms of personalities on both sides, in terms of people who have much larger platforms and ways to get their messages out there um, in, in ways that that vastly override whatever, you know, calm, measured reporting um, the, the CBS or NBC or CNNs of the world can do, then I think, no, they don't get better because there are too many people that are too deeply entrenched um, in this world, uh, in this society that have too big of a platform. And their first thought is, what is the far left perspective on this? What is the far right perspective on this? Instead of saying, what is the truth? And how, how do I use my voice um, as responsibly as possible to get to the truth? And to answer it in that way, I don't think that people are doing a very good job at all in either way. Rob Smith, everybody, contributor for the first TV, also author of Always a Soldier, which is coming out soon. We'll have him back on to talk about his book. Rob, man, good to see you. Always appreciate your perspective. Thanks for the time. All right, man. Thanks a lot. Team, right before we get to roll call, I almost forgot the the, uh, would-be Democrat president of the United States was asked about... uh, what about the women who will not vote for him because of the Tara Reid allegations? Uh, you know, the, the Democrat dance on this whole subject has been fascinating to watch. They'll just say whatever they feel like saying. I mean, there's there's no accountability. There's it's just the, the, they've changed. I mean, the, the standard under Kavanaugh was one thing. The standard under Biden is another. The standard for Trump was one thing. The standard for Biden is another. And, you know, you, you'll never hear. Uh, I mean, you had anchors, even CNN anchors that have said many times, you know, Trump sexually assaults. They, they say it as a matter of fact. They don't just say that there have been allegations. They'll say that Trump sexually assaults women. Uh, have they ever said that about Joe Biden? Why? Oh, oh, of course. We know why, because CNN is an appendage of the DNC taking taking orders um, from. Well, actually, I'm, I wonder sometimes maybe the DNC is an appendage of CNN. But here you have uh, Joe Biden when he's asked about that right before. I wanted to get this in before we get to roll call. Uh, Play clip nine here on these allegations from Tara Reid. I know you've denied them, but you've you've also said that women should be believed. So what do you say to Americans who believe Tara Reid and won't vote for you because of it? Well, that's their right. Look here. Look, I think women should be believed. They should have an opportunity to have their case and state it just forthrightly what their case is. Then it's the responsibility of responsible journalists like you and everyone else to go out and investigate those. The end of the day, the truth is the truth. That's what should prevail. And the truth is this never happened. 
This never happened. Yes, I right. assure you. That's the truth. Why does it anyone ever ask Joe Biden, is Tara Reid lying? That's a question that I think they should ask. He's saying it didn't happen. So really, what alternative is there other than that he's suggesting that Tara Reid is, in fact, lying? She's lying. And this must be for politically motivated reasons or some kind of bitterness. But they never ask that. Somehow we're supposed to think that Joe Biden believes Tara Reid, but is telling us that what she's saying is not true. That, that seems to be the, the bridge that he's trying to straddle between these two issues. You know, uh, he, he believes her or, or thinks that people, ha- people should believe her and hear her, but she's not telling the truth. There's a problem here. And you should also remember Robbie Suave mentioned this uh, in, earlier in the show. Biden and the Obama administration were all about re- removing any Title IX Uh, any Title IX procedural protections for men on campus accused of sexual assault. So it's not like he's even changed his tune on due process in general. Just due process for Joe Biden right now, because the Democrats really need it. That's that's what we're being told. But also just that that he thinks that we need to be told in this this very kind of weird and and almost almost condescending way. You know, she has a right to tell her story. uh, Forth, forthrightly and uh, yeah, yeah, we know she has a right to say what she wants to say, yeah, yeah, jackass. The point here is, do people get to assess that or do we get to uh, do we have to believe her? Because that's what the Democrats were all saying about Kavanaugh and that Kavanaugh should step down merely because of the allegation. Step down from the confirmation process of being in the Supreme Court. Oh, Joe Biden doesn't have an answer to that. Doesn't have an answer. All right, now we can get to Roll Call. Hit it. It's time for Roll Call. All right, Roll Call, everybody. Thank you so much for joining for this. Facebook.com slash Buck Sexton if you want to be in on the Roll Call action. Uh, or Team Buck at iHeartMedia.com if you want to email us. If you hear some snorting, it's because my French Bulldog is sitting in my lap as I do this. Uh, because she's running around the apartment and making too much noise as I'm doing the radio show. So there you have it. Uh, I am not all of a sudden developing a loud daytime snore, nor do I snort constantly, or at least not as much as my little furry friend here does. Um, But she's now being a very good girl and sitting quietly. I think she just wanted some attention. That's right, Tallulah. You're a sweetheart. Okay, here we go. Alan. Hey, Buck. Good day to you. I happen to be one of those people that hasn't spent one day in self-quarantine because of where I live. I also vote with my feet. I live in areas where they believe in the Constitution. You really need to take your show to one of those great flyover states. Shields high, keep your powder dry, and your voice strong. Well, thank you, Alan. And uh, yeah, man, I kind of envy anybody who's able to exercise basic day-to-day freedom. Producer Mark, what is the first thing, the first thing that if... Everything were reopened, which is going to be a long time before that happens. But if everything were back in action, is the first thing a sporting, I mean, a big sporting event for you? Is the first thing going to a, a Mets game because you're a Mets fan, unfortunately? What do you mean, Instead unfortunately? Just saying. If you can name, like, a player on the Yankees right now, then I'll, I'll, I'll let you mock me. <laughs> I, I, I actually cannot. Okay. If you ask who my favorite Yankee is, I would say Don Mattingly. Wow. That is a uh, throwback. And he's currently, yeah. do you even know that he's a manager in Major League Baseball right now? I didn't, but I know the guy had a great mustache back <laughs> in the day. Fantastic. Uh, I yeah. guess sporting event, but I think in general just my life back, just going to yeah. work, having a routine, doing stuff. Yeah. Is there one restaurant that you're like, if it were open, I'd go back to it? Uh, maybe like a good Italian place. It's hard to make mm. at-home Italian, re- and takeout's not the same. Oh, man, the snow princess, she, she thought I was having a hard day yesterday, and she was right. So she made um, gluten-free spaghetti carbonara, which was so good that she caught me sneaking some cold out of the fridge because we had some leftovers cold? this morning for breakfast. <laughs> I mean, you could have at least put it in a bowl and heated it up. That's Buck. what she said. She's like, you're not going to like put it in the microwave or anything? I was like, um, I like it cold. <laughs> no, you don't. Who likes it cold? Like I'm like the kid that that eats too much of the cookie dough before it goes in the oven, but I'm doing it with cold with cold carbon. Which she just pointed at me and said, "I also do that," which is true. I oh, do. I mean, eating cookie dough is completely normal. Eating cookie dough, producer Mark says, eating cookie dough is legit. I'll have yeah. you know. I will literally just buy a pack of cookie dough and not bake it. 
<laughs> he just said he'll just eat the cookie dough when he buys the pack of it. I uh, love it. Yeah, that's a thing that could happen sometimes. All righty. Um, oh, I just would say for me, the thing that I would do, for restaurants are, I'm really into restaurants. I, I'm not somebody that goes to that many concert venues or anything like that. So, uh, but it would be great to be able to go to the U.S. Open because I do like to do that uh, this fall. So that's like end of August, early September. If that's back, that would be really nice. But I don't know, huge. I mean, that's going to be tough because you got huge crowds and a lot of a lot of challenges there. All right, back to roll call here. Christine, hey, Buck, I listen to your podcast each morning while I hike with my dog. I suffer from PTSD, so hiking with my dog, listening to you really helps tame my morning anxiety. Oh, well, thank you, Christine. I'm glad that we can, we can help you. However, I don't know why you keep giving Gavin Newsom a pass. I'm a third-generation Californian who cannot stomach what Gavin is doing to our beautiful state. His response has been horrible. We're the first state to get COVID-19 and have low death rates, yet he ignores the numerous studies from Stanford and USC that show lockdown is wrong. I couldn't believe Mike Slater was so easy on him. Those masks from China are a big deal. Park beaches and playgrounds, parks, beaches and playgrounds rather, are shuttered with police tape to make us feel like we're living in a police state. Shields high. I enjoy the show and listen to you and producer Mark along with the Tulu updates. Tulu, do you want to say something? I'm trying to see if she'll make some little snorty noise into the, you know, she'll make her radio debut. Come on. Come on, make a little, do the little piggy noise you do. Come on. Come on. Get nothing? Uh, she's she's right ne- now. She's being shy. She doesn't want to. She's right next to the mic, and she doesn't want to do it. For, do it for us. Uh, but Christine, you know, I've I don't think, and I, look, I don't want to. Mike Slater is my man. He's my my colleague and a great guy. So I I don't want to speak for him. Um, I don't think that I have been easy on Gavin Newsom. I think that he was smart enough politically not to look like a big anti-Trump hack in the early stages of this, which also Cuomo was trying to do in the early stages. So there was a little bit of bipartisan goodwill when we were all very scared and this seemed like a really big problem. Um, As for uh, my sense of Newsom, yeah, I mean, of course, California is terribly run. I mean, the last person, the last time I was in California, and this this is the truth, I actually saw someone... I mean, I don't even want to describe it on radio, but I saw someone in with in a crowded place, you know, relieve themselves in a way that you would only expect to see in a up oh, there. It was you heard a little a little bit of a snort from her uh, in a third world country. So it was I'm well aware of how poorly run California is and what a, a really what a massive big state lib Gavin Newsom actually is. So I think that. Uh, yeah, I think that that's a, a real problem. And if I haven't been hard enough on Newsom, well, then I apologize. And I got to I got to make sure that I work on that a little bit. But um, thank you very much for writing in. Always good to always good to have the perspective of Team Buck, California. I will have you know that producer Mark just asked me who's gained more weight in quarantine, me or Tallulah. And I will tell you that the Frenchie and I, we have quite a competition going right now. But uh, we're, we're just, we're quarantined pleasantly plump. Uh, she's an old lady. She's 11. So that's like 77 in dog years. So she's, she's way up there. Back to a roll call. Facebook.com slash Buck Sexton. Jessica writes in, hey, Buck, I have some family from Minnesota. And your accent representing them doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> I could just be ignorant on their accent, but you sound more Jamaican in my opinion. It's still funny though. Shields high. I sound Jamaican? <laughs> I don't know about that. I don't know about I, Jamaican. I, 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 would, I wouldn't say it sounds Jamaican. So it's basically if you've ever seen um, the mom in uh, Bobby's world, or if you've ever seen Fargo, they kind of have this like they talk. They, and it's not everywhere. And it's been explained to me this is from the Youpers. Um, in in Upper Peninsula, Michigan, and probably maybe just some parts of, of Minnesota. You have to also remember, regional accents are very specific. So I'm here in New York City, and people always say, I don't have a New York accent. Well, I actually sound like people from Manhattan. There are Brooklyn accents. There are Queens accents. There's Long Island. There's Jersey. Producer Mark, do you think you have a, a a bit of a a bit of a Long Island? I used to a lot more. Like I moved to Florida when I was a kid, and everyone was like, "Why are you saying water like that?" and stuff like that. Yeah. But then once I realized I was getting into broadcasting, I kind of nipped yeah, it in you, the bud and wanted to sound Midwest like you're supposed to. 
Right, right. The uh, the what is it they call it? Like the um, the non non regional mid Atlantic uh, broadcaster exactly. diction. Yeah, but no, I mean, producer Mark, no, I mean, if he, he comes from Long Island, and yeah, that's a perfect example. If you're from Long Island, you'll say water, you'll say talk, you'll say car. These are, these are accent things that come from, uh, from Long Island, from, from Brooklyn, from Queens. Um, so, yeah, there you have it. Glenn, uh, Buck and producer Mark, in regard to General Flynn, you always say that the process is the punishment. Even if they wouldn't get a prosecution in D.C., wouldn't it still be fair to run these people through the process and financially inconvenience them. Thanks for the truth you spread. Shields high. Uh, so you're saying, why don't they press charges against the people that set up General Flynn? And to that, I'll just tell you, they won't do it because they don't want to do it. Because they would view it, they would view it as too damaging uh, for the morale of people who still work in the FBI in these places. Uh, you know, there's but there's really not a good answer for this. I mean, you're probably saying, well, Buck, who cares? They they they'll prosecute people who are low level for far more minor things than what happened here at a very senior level. And that's definitely true. But um, they just won't they won't do it. I mean, I can tell you that. Look at what they have. Look at what with uh, went down with McCabe lied under oath twice. The inspector general said they said he was lacked candor, which is a fancy way of saying he lied. And they didn't press charges against him just because they're not going to because the machine takes care of its own. I wish there was a more satisfying answer than that, but there really isn't. Uh, so I'm just telling you the truth, as I always do. Jake. Hey, Buckster, now the charges against Flynn have been dropped. What will the reparations be for the cost he incurred to reputation and finances during the course of the investigation? Is there any mandated reimbursement of legal fees if the investigation turns out to be bunk or does a person have to pursue a costly civil case to get their money back? Reputation is a harder one battle unless the government is willing to prostrate itself publicly to fully exonerate someone, which it won't. Thanks for all you do. Shields high. Jake, uh, you are uh, you're correct about how it's tough to get your reputation back and that the government unless that's why, for example, in the Duke lacrosse case. Now, that wasn't federal government. That was a uh, local prosecutor in the, in the uh, district attorney's office. For, for Durham in North Carolina. Uh, but that's why when they came out and said these people were, meaning the Duke lacrosse, lacrosse kids, it's not that they were not guilty. They were innocent. They came out and said there was absolutely nothing that they did wrong. And, the, and you know, they had, a, they had one kid, for example, who was miles away when this thing happened, and the woman claimed that he was one of the ones that assaulted her. So uh, that's unusual, though. You're right. Usually the government will not say, hey, we're terrible and horrible, and we messed this thing up really badly. You know, Ruby Ridge, which gets attention now because of the Waco series that I highly recommend. Producer Mark watched it all. I watched it all. I mean, Mark, what do you, you give it? A, a minus? Yeah, a minus. A minus. Yeah, yeah. I say it definitely a minus a minus B plus for me. Uh, it Ruby Ridge. I think the federal government ended up paying out three million dollars to that family in damages. So does Flynn have a civil case against the government? I would I would like to think so. But that's tricky. There's all this qualified immunity that kicks in especially for prosecutors there's very little good oversight of prosecutorial abuse it's incredibly rare for a prosecutor to go to prison mike nifong who was the prosecutor in the duke lacrosse case now that's state not federal he was disbarred and fired he didn't go to prison and he was knowingly and willfully trying to send young men to prison for a rape that he knew did not happen and they did not commit he didn't go to prison. So prosecutors can get a. There is nothing that is more dangerous to your liberty, really, in this country than a power mad leftist prosecutor. There's no, honestly any power mad, just power mad, power mad prosecutor. Nothing more dangerous to your liberty. Uh, Robert writes, I am so glad you rated the movie Uncut Gems as an eye stabber. I tried it about four months ago and had to stop halfway through it. Never picked it up again. Sandler just seems to try way too hard. He overacts almost every scene. The dialogue is unnecessarily vulgar as well. It was just bad. Love the show. Hope you're able to get out soon because you're sounding a bit edgy these days. Hang in there. Oh, Robert, you know, I've been locked up for two months. So, yeah, I probably do, do get, feel a little edgy. Producer Mark, we only got about 20 seconds, but you want to respond to Robert's uncut gems? You're just both wrong. It was one of Sandler's best ever performances. <laughs> there you go. That's how we're on the show today. Producer Mark says, you're both wrong. All right. We'll leave it there. Please do check out BuckSexon.com, team. Uh, we got more and more new stories going up there. Also, 
Subscribe. We got a couple thousand. We want thousands and thousands more. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash Buck Sexton. More and more videos going up there. Until tomorrow, Shields High.